have your Bibles with you this morning, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 46, as we begin a new sermon series called God and You. We'll be continuing through the teachings of Jesus, and over the next few weeks, you'll be going through the book of Matthew, and the teachings that Matthew has recorded from Jesus' mouth to the very pages that you have in front of you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you have given us together this morning. Lord, we are filled with praise over seeing what it is that you've been doing in the young people's lives in our church. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless them as they will be leaving their homes. Lord, in starting their lives as young adults, and Lord, that you would guide and direct them, that you would, Lord, strengthen them to live for your gospel. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of giving us the Korean people here to meet in our building, to meet with us, to share with us praises in your name in a different tongue. As we get a glimpse of someday what we will get to see by sight, where every nation, tribe, and tongue will sing before your throne. Thank you for the baptisms this morning and seeing two little girls walk in obedience to what it is that you've commanded us to do. Lord, we have sung, we have prayed, we have given to you, and now we come to the hearing of your word. This is a time in our worship, Lord, where we get to hear directly from your word. You, the creator of the universe, have recorded for us all that is necessary for faith for salvation, and that, Lord, you and your great mercy gave these things to us that we may know you and know your gospel. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that your words would be heard, the Lord's hearts would be softened, that, Lord, it would be your speech and not my own, and, Lord, that all of us would be edified by what it is it is contained within your word, and that, Lord, you would be glorified. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love my kids. Um, they are an endless source of sermon illustrations. They are an endless source of joy and wonder, and, and some of the things about kids that you like are also the things that you don't like. They mimic you, and sometimes that's not the best thing. Um, but sometimes that's all right. And so I have already been able to train my oldest two in fear and admonition of the Lord that if you were to prompt them about cardinals, they will promptly tell you that they are yucky. <laughs> and that they will, my daughter especially will tell you when you ask her, what does a wildcat do? And she will say, Rawr. And my oldest will tell you, Daddy, we just don't like red. I'm very happy with this. <laughs> this weekend I've been attempting, and we'll put the focus on attempt, at building a swing set. Not my gift. And as I'm out there in the garage, uh, struggling with tools that I barely can pronounce, let alone know what they do, Audrey and Alexander are sitting there and they're going, Daddy, how long is this going to take you? And after the third or fourth time that they've asked me this, I said, long time. <laughs> and then Audrey keeps saying, so you'll be done later today. <laughs> no, I will not. <laughs> and so Alexander looks over at Audrey and he goes, Daddy said a long time. It could be June or July before he's finished. <laughs> he knows his dad well. 
or the, how they're always there to give you random statements that don't make any sense, but you love them all the same. As we came in the other night, uh, for whatever reason, I had a bout with the hiccups, and Audrey looks over at me, and she says, Daddy, you always get hiccups sometimes. <laughs> Sounded profound. But I also love that with my oldest uh, at night, we get to sit together and, and read before he goes to bed, and I've been... Uh, catechizing him over the last few months, asking him questions um, that he's memorizing the answer to so he'll learn biblical truths. And I love to hear him uh, as I come back to him uh, a few times a week, and he has got these things memorized, and he's got them down pat, and I can just say, Alexander, what's your only comfort in life and death? And he'll say that I'm not my own, but I belong to God. And you love that about your kids. Like, again, you, you have this where you mimic things to them that are silly, that are funny, or that they mimic things about you or learn things about you that you may not all be that happy about, but that you can also teach them the ways of the Lord and see them grow to learn and love Jesus. But some of the hardest things that you well know that you have to do as a parent is sometimes they don't want to listen to you. They don't want to have anything to do with whatever it is that's about to come out of your mouth. And as my children are both my older two are both strong-willed, and undoubtedly my third, as he gets older, will most likely be as well. Um, I don't know where they get that from, but um, their mother. Um, <laughs> she's in the next service, so I can, I can get away with it. <laughs> but that when they proceed to say, I don't want to do that, Daddy, I don't want to do that, I'll look at them and I'll say, you need to obey me. I need you to obey me. And sometimes they'll say, well, why? And I say, because I'm your daddy. It's the only reason I need. And so when we come to this text and we see some of the confusion about Jesus' family and he answers and tells them, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother, we can understand Jesus saying, so he'll say later explicitly in Matthew, he says, obey me. And we ask him, why? Because <laughs> I'm Jesus. Because I'm Jesus, and that's the only reason he needs. And so, if you can think back in your minds, it's been a long time ago, think back two or three snow ice storms ago, we were back in Matthew, in the passage right before this, where the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus, the Pharisees are always causing problems with Jesus, and they want signs from Jesus. Uh, they want uh, him to do the things that they proclaim they say need to be done by the Messiah. And Matthew does a great job in setting up his gospel and, and kind of letting us know what it is that's going on in the mind of the Pharisees and the Jews that are around Jesus because he starts off his gospel with a genealogy. You might go, well, that's a strange way of knowing what's going on, but his genealogy is unique. He, he starts you with Abraham. And then he, he takes you through um, in three successive 14-person generations and gets you to Jesus. And what he's wanting you to know is that Jesus is in the lineage of Abraham, that Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of the covenant with Abraham, and that the Jews are looking for someone that has something to do with Abraham except for that they're just not looking for it in the right way. You see that as they go through this, they are thinking that... Um, Jesus is going to provide for them sort of a uh, genealogical salvation in the sense that they think that because they're God's people that they can trace their bloodlines back to Abraham that somehow God is owing them something. And that Jesus needs to recognize this in them and find them as special and then therefore, if he really is the Messiah, he needs to raise up and overthrow these Romans. For they're, they're Abraham's children. Doesn't he know this? And so for him to not prove to them, for we are the lineage of Abraham, we are Israel, for him not to prove to them is insulting to them. And so Matthew begins sharing with us, showing us that Jesus is a man like us, born in a lineage like us, but a special lineage. But then Matthew takes us through his gospel and he ends with the Great Commission. He ends with Jesus is the boss. Jesus is in charge of absolutely everything. 
So a man who's born like us but is God and therefore has all power and authority and therefore he who has all power and authority, you probably should listen to him. And so then everything that is contained in between, you ought to probably pay attention to what it is that he's saying. Pay attention to what it is that he's doing. And so these Pharisees that are around, that are stirring up the people, that are explaining to Jesus that you need to be able to do these things. You need to be able to do what it is that we say, as we command. And Jesus reminds them that trees are known by their fruit. What are you doing? How are you obeying? He tells them that whatever signs that they seek, it will never be enough. And they'll be condemned for their asking for it. And that when the return of the unclean spirit, which is maybe the most damning thing he says of all to them, he says that you'll be worse off than you were before because you haven't listened to me. And then comes this passage where Jesus has his mother and his brothers coming up to him. Mark and Luke also record this, this uh, story. And we don't know exactly, lots of commentators, lots of people want to tell you lots of reasons why they come up. They think that Jesus is kind of half crazy like everybody else, and we don't necessarily know that. We don't know 100% why it is that they come, but they are. And Jesus uses this as another teaching opportunity. And he replies, asking this peculiar question, he says, well, who really is my mother and who are my brothers? Some of what's peculiar is that the Pharisees thought it beneath them to have anything to do with teaching women, let alone really relating with women, and that he is looking out before them and saying that women have some part in what it is that he's come to bring. But that he tells them that obedience trumps pedigree. That obedience trumps pedigree, and, and this is a big deal, because many of us are multi-generational churchgoers. Oh, my grandfather was in church, or my great-grandfather was in church, and my parents were in church, and now I'm in church. I'm owed something by God. I attend all the time. Jesus says, pedigree counts for nothing. It's obedience. How well do you listen to what it is that I say? So Jesus challenges their ideas about family as well as he challenges ours. They believe that they're the children of Abraham, and thus that they are family. But they're missing what Jesus really has to say and what Jesus has really come to do. With Abraham, he understood that he was unworthy of what it is that God had called him to do. And thus he was willing to place his promised son upon the altar to be sacrificed. He knew of his shortcomings and his failures and he trusted the Lord to do whatever it would be necessary that was good. And Jesus comes and does the same. How does he treat his family? How does he treat those that are around him? And think about this too. He says, as he looks around, uh, he stretches out his hand towards his disciples, and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and mother. And remember by the end of Matthew where are they all going to be? They're all going to run away from him. And he says this about them. Of course, it doesn't end on that low note, does it? The book of Acts picks up and it gets much better. But what does Jesus do for them in the meantime? He has hard things to say. He's going to tell them that you've got to love me more than you love anything else in this world. Anything. You've got to follow me with all of your heart. Your perfection has to exceed that of the Pharisees. You're to be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. He has hard things to say. And he, he says, follow me. I, the burden I give to you is easy. My yoke is light. And how does Jesus prove this? What's he do for his family? He takes their punishment. He takes his family's shame and he restores their honor. He shows selfless humility. For all of these people who would turn 
against him, all these people who want to claim him one moment and then want to throw him under the bus the next, Jesus doesn't change. He continues to march forward towards his death, towards the wrath that has been stored up for these people, for his family, so that they can earn a place with him, but based upon his righteousness, not upon theirs. And so it it begins to ask us some questions about who do we love? Who do we follow? What do we think of when we say love in our day and time? Imagine, if you will, men, husbands. How well is your wife going to take that you come to tell her every day that you love her, but you never enjoy spending any time with her? You never help her in any of the things that she likes to get done or needs to get done? You never seem to enjoy any of the things that she wants to go do. You don't celebrate any of the things that she does for you. But you tell her you love her all the time. But you're out doing the things that you enjoy to do or doing nothing. And that you find out that the more that your marriage is about you and about what you get, the less of any type of marriage that demonstrates love do you have. Or how well do your children take If you continue to tell your children, I love you, I love you, but you're never there for any of the important events of their lives. You're never there for them when they need your help and your advice. You're never there to teach them about the Lord. Well, how is it that we can tell Jesus that we love him, but we have absolutely no demonstration of it whatsoever in our lives? Lord Jesus, I follow you. You're my Savior, but I refuse to obey you. It's nonsensical. How is it that we could have some sort of understanding that we couldn't love our wives, our husbands, our children, or any other members of our family in the way in which we sometimes claim to love Jesus? With our mixed up sin riddled minds, we forget that actually obedience to Jesus is actually real freedom. That real freedom doesn't come from disobedience to Jesus and sinning. It actually comes from freedom, comes from following Jesus. If we listen to Jesus, not only do we get him as our reward in the next life, but when we obey him, our lives now will actually be better. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be rich and famous as lots of people want to use that term, that your lives will be better as somehow that has everything to do with it. No. But you read the news, you read the uh, newspaper, you watch the news, you have family members, you have friends, you see daily all of your friends, all of your family, and and maybe even including yourself when you have time, all the repetition of pain and hurt that sin causes in your lives and your family's lives, and lots of it is even unintended sin. You didn't mean to hurt those people, or they didn't mean all this to happen afterwards. You see it all the time. If you listen to Jesus, if we obey him, will your life not be all that much less traumatic? (laughs) He doesn't give us these things to say, do this, it's a test. He actually says, do these things and life will be better. Follow me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Follow me and all the pain and the problems that you cause for yourself in your life with your sin, those things go away because it's sin that causes those, not me. Were Adam and Eve better off in the garden when they didn't listen to God or when they did? Same goes for us. In the book of Galatians, Paul tells us in chapter 5, verse 1, that for freedom's sake, Jesus came to set you free. That's what the gospel is for. I once had a couple I was counseling, and they, um, they didn't come to me willingly. They were um, court-ordered um, that they had to come to me. There had been some uh, abuse back and forth in their relationship. And I began to question them about how their previous relationships had gone. And I asked them, I said, well, how did you end up together? And they said, well, we met at a bar. And three days later, we moved in with each other. And um, now it's been two months, and we're fighting all the time. And I said, okay, tell me about your previous relationship, both of them. Well, we met them at a bar. Three days later, we moved in with them, and it became an abusive relationship. I said, any more? Well, there was a relationship before that. 
Met him at a bar. Three days later, we moved in together. Turned into an abusive relationship. Insanity, right? The definition is doing the same thing over again and expecting different results. Jesus gives us a path, tells us how it is that we are to be married. Tells us how it is that we are to treat our spouses. And the expectations from following Jesus should be drastically different than the expectations from con continual and abject sin and look at what they reaped. But it even goes beyond us. Our obedience is demanded so that we may have the privilege of getting to see others be set free as well. Matthew tells us this story. He begins with the genealogy of Jesus. He ends with the Great Commission. And he tells us this story to be obedient so that other people may be set free. Remember, Jesus tells us then, what are we to do? Because he has all power, because he has all authority. We're to make disciples. And what is the condition of making disciples? Teaching them to obey what? Everything that Jesus has commanded. And the problem is, is our sin tells us that that's not really all that important, that it's somebody else's job or someone else will take care of it. I have other things that God has called me to do. And Mark Dever has a great quote regarding this. He says, Our pride causes us to worry more about what our friends will think about us than what God will do to them because of their sins. Our pride causes us to worry more about what our friends will think about us than what God will do to them because of their sins. Do your hearts break for the lost? If you don't think that Jesus' heart broke for the lost, go back and read John chapter 10. <laughs> what does he come to do for his sheep? He comes to lay down his life for them. He's the king of the universe. He can have anything and everything create anything by the breath of his mouth, and he gives up his life for the lost sheep, the lost sheep who want him dead, the lost sheep who, who shout for Barabbas, the lost sheep who come and put nails in his hands and his feet, the lost sheep who mock him, who spit upon him. Jesus gives up his life for those sheep. Why do our hearts not break for those very same ones that Jesus came to die for? What are we worried about? Is our pride messing with us? Our sin worried more about ourselves than we are worried about what the king of the universe has given us the privilege and the call to go and do. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Do we not want to be brothers, sisters, mothers of Jesus? Let's listen to what he says. For Jesus says, if you are part of my family and you love me, then Eat your pride and do as I say and as I do. You and those who are around you will be better for it. So why is it that we can pretend to love Jesus in a way that we would never say is adequate for any other human being? Where we pay him lip service, but we don't do anything that he tells us that we need to do. You see, when life is more about us, when life is more about you and your ability, or you and your fear, or you and your lack of confidence, you will do nothing. Why? Because it's about you, and you have good reason to have lack of confidence. You have good reason to have fear, as do I. But it's not about us. You are to know whom it is in whom you believe. What length, what cost did Jesus go to make us part of his family? And so when your obedience comes out of love in response to what it is that Jesus has done, your confidence will swell because it rests not on you but on Jesus. If Jesus is willing to go to these lengths to save you, do you not think that when he tells you go and make disciples that disciples will be made? Do you not think that whatever it is that you lose in this life, maybe people will mock us, but do we care? I mean, are we in high school? It's not a popularity contest. It's about bringing souls <laughs> that are guaranteed an eternity in hell without Jesus to life. Who wants anyone to go to hell? And when you think of your family members and your friends that you know are lost, do you want any of them? 
to go there. Our pride causes us to worry more about ourselves than what God is going to do to the lost because of their sins if they don't know Jesus. Jesus says, follow me, do as I say, make disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded. Do we not think that if he's good enough to save us, if he's good enough to die for us, that he's good enough to take care of this too? Matt Chandler, pastor of a church in Dallas, when discussing these problems that we have, especially when it comes to obedience to Christ and the concern that we'll have in our lives, not just through abject evangelism, but just the fact that we'll look weird and we'll look different, he says, what do you think that you ever could have said to Lazarus to scare him? Do you think Lazarus ever went around going, I'm afraid to do that, Jesus. I don't know about that. I mean, you brought me back from the dead, but I don't know if, that, if I can go and tell other people about that. Is there anything that could have been said to frighten Lazarus? We should be in the same position. He has brought us in the same way from death to life. There should be nothing that makes us afraid. We have Jesus. We have our Lord and Savior that created the heavens and the earth with the breath of his mouth, died for us on the cross, raised, came back to life on the third day. It's never been about us. It's never, ever been about us. It's always been about him. Let us trust him. Let us obey him. Let us follow him. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would be desirous to obey, to do the will of you, our Heavenly Father, that sent your precious son into this world to die for us. Lord, I pray that we would be desirous to be brothers and sisters and mothers in the family of God of Jesus and that we would love one another as Jesus has loved us. Lord, have our hearts to be broken for the lost. Lord, have us to love the lost and be in awe of the gospel for others in the same way in which we have been in awe in it and all of it, and thankful for you bringing us from death to life. Lord, we thank you that you have loved us despite who we are and that we have your awe-inspiring righteousness and goodness to trust in. For we, Lord, are abject failures without you. Lord, so we pray, awaken us. Bring revival amongst us. Allow us the privilege of seeing many, many people be brought from death to life and celebrating one day, not just by faith, but by sight around your throne, praising you forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.